When William Harrison left his house on a calm midsummer evening of 1660, no one expected him to not return for two years, except maybe William himself, or maybe not. Equally surprising would have been the confessions of murder that followed from a trio of servants, one of whom was an alleged witch, and none of whom could possibly have been guilty, given the fact that the victim was very much alive. Later to become known as the Camden Wonder, this is the tale of a tightly bound mystery made up of lies, superstition and sensationalism that after 350 years is as bizarre today as it was in the 17th century. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Dark History Season 4, Episode 13. I'm Ben as always and it's fantastic to be back. I hope you're all well. Uh, this episode is absolutely bonkers, so I want to get going as quick as possible. But as always, it's got a little bit of ramble. Well over a year ago, I started this episode um, and I was looking for a source and I couldn't find it. Um, and I did find it in a private archive um and but the guy who ran the archive it was like a private folio archive but the guy who ran the archive basically said if, if you want copies of things then he can do that for you um you just have to send him a check basically which goes to show like kind of how this all works because i mean who uses checks these days right so i i sent them an email saying like great I'd, I'd like a copy of this particular folio that'd be amazing um and i never heard back from them ever and then just last week or, or literally a few days ago i got a copy of the source they obviously read my email and didn't reply a year later <laughs> and just sent it to me out of the blue so that that was amazing so I, I could finish this episode which is great so that's a really weird way of this episode kind of coming together but anyway it's bonkers and i think you're going to enjoy it but before we get started i just want to say thank you to all the new patrons as always we got karen or that, that could be Karin, because I knew someone called Karin once, and she spelled her name that way as well. So I think it might be Karin, Karen, I don't know. I hope one of those is right. But anyway, thank you. Uh, we've got Rebecca, Christopher, Kelsey, Tara, Charles, Georgina, Margaret, Brian, Daphne, Amanda, Ashley, Margot, Deanna and Randall. So thank you very much. I've also got a shout out to Ben Cervantes uh, from your wife who purchased your Patreon uh, subscription um, for your 22nd wedding anniversary. And she just asked me to just give you a shout out, basically saying like, this is to Ben Cervantes from your wife for our anniversary. So, so A, that's just super cool. And B, congratulations to you and your wife, Ben. And I don't know if... Your wife wants me to read her name out, so I'm not going to. Um, but congratulations to you two on your 22nd anniversary. And yeah, great to have you on board. Thanks very much for your support. So here we go. We're going to just plow straight into the episode now. And this one is called The Strange Tale of the Camden Wonder. Thursday the 16th of August 1660 was a warm, clear summer's day. The blue skies of midsummer saw slow-moving light cloud pass across a deep blue sky at what had been a mild season, with temperatures averaging 16 degrees centigrade. The market town of Chipping Camden, perched along the northern edge of the Cotswolds in Gloucestershire, 95 miles to the northwest of London and 60 miles north of Bath, was on the wrong end of the market boom, having previously enjoyed a solid trade in wool that had lasted from the Middle Ages. The town orbited around a central high street, with houses built of local amber-coloured limestone and dark tiled or thatched roofing. In 1340, the town's central wool trading building, the Wool Staplers Hall, was built to support what was now the booming and central star in the local economy. And 40 years later, William Greville, a prosperous wool merchant based in London, built the first manor house in Chipping Camden. The building up of the market town continued over the following few centuries, almost solely financed by the wool trade. However, the 17th century saw a rude awakening for the town. Despite the arrival in 1610 of Sir Baptist Hicks, a textile trader himself and one of the richest, most powerful men in the country, who built property in Chipping Camden, the town's prospects 
began to look far more bleak than the large, honey-coloured stone buildings would have visitors believe. By the early 17th century, the town's wool trade had already begun to dwindle as cloth manufactured elsewhere began to rise in value, production and demand. The area was then dealt a hammer blow when its application to become a staple town was rejected by the crown. With the wool trade as prosperous as it had been, the crown saw in it an opportunity to siphon money into its own coffers forcing by law a requirement that all wool trading towns apply to become official traders known as staple towns. For official staple towns who are successful in their applications, trade could continue, though under heavy taxation. However, many other towns who saw their applications rejected essentially saw their main driver of the local economy snuffed out overnight. Chipping Camden had applied to become a staple town in 1617 but found its application unsuccessful, and the years following its rejection saw its prosperity begin to dwindle. Fortunately for the locals, Sir Baptist Hicks, who had begun his career as a successful London textiles dealer, was now one of the richest men in the country, and he was a willing benefactor to the town. His brother, who was secretary to the Lord Treasurer, had helped Hicks to secure several contracts to the Crown, including supplying the King's coronation with damask cloth a job for which he was later awarded a knighthood. Hugely wealthy from his previous businesses, Hicks became a moneylender, at times even to the king himself, lending huge sums of over £150,000, owning eye-watering debts that would total into the tens of millions of pounds today. Outside of building his own grand property in Chipping Camden, he hoovered up areas of surrounding land, which he rented to local tenants, and continued to build up the town's market infrastructure during the difficult period that the locals were feeling due to being forced to realign the local economy. Along with its decapitated economy, the looming civil war was a further complication that threw Chipping Camden into further difficulties, when local royalist troops occupied Hicks Manor only to have the entire thing burnt to the ground two years later. The reasons for the arson have been attributed to both retreating soldiers and anti-royalists, with proof of neither gleaning any solid light on the matter. Regardless, the result was the same. Hicks's grand manor found itself in ruin, with only the gatehouse, still grand as it was, remaining standing. By 1660, the restoration of King Charles II was complete, and with the reinstatement of the monarchy, a period of great instability began its slow recovery, at least as far as the royalists were concerned. It was within this atmosphere that William Harrison, a 70-year-old citizen of Chipping Camden and steward to what remained of the Hicks's estate, left his house to collect the rents for his master, the daughter of Hicks, Lady Camden, on the afternoon of the 16th of August. Leaving the gatehouse, he began his two-mile trek along the highway to the neighbouring town of Charingworth, where he was due a considerable sum of rent from the tenants there. The road between the two towns was heavily trafficked by traders ferrying goods between the market towns. Though not great hubs of commerce, Chipping Camden held a population of over 1,100, and on the well-tempered summer's evening, the roads would have been travelled reasonably well by locals toing and froing. By 9pm that night, however, William had failed to return, and concerned for her husband's well-being, Mrs Harrison sent the family servant, John Perry, out to meet him along the road to Charingworth. John was a local man, aged 25 years old, who had lived with the Harrison family from a young age. Despite living with the Harrisons, his family had still lived locally, though his mother and father had been members of the servant class and been relatively poor. His mother, Joan, still resided in the town of Camden, though his father had died three years prior, leaving her a poor widow, and as such, she had picked up a troubled reputation amongst the locals, and quiet rumours circulated that the old lady was a witch. His elder brother, Richard, who was married, had two children and also lived locally. When John had reached the outskirts of Camden, he met William Reed, another Camden man, and told him of his task to catch up to his master. Reed confirmed that he hadn't seen William on the road, and with the night drawing in heavily, John told Reed that he didn't much fancy walking to Charingworth alone. Accompanying Reed back into town, John went to the Harrison stable to collect one of his master's horses and he left Reed at the gates. 
As he made his way out of the stable, he met with another Camden man named Pierce. Explaining his situation, as he had to read, he walked out onto the fields with Pierce to look for any sign of William's return, before giving up and walking back to the barn. Restless, but with time to kill before he could make his way to Charingworth under the moonlight, John then laid down in the hen roost until midnight. After he woke up from this brief rest, he made his way to the town, aided by the silvery light of the moon, which was by now shining brightly in the sky. As he made his way along the highway, however, a heavy mist rolled in, and not wanting to find himself lost, John instead opted to crash out under a heavy hedge by the roadside until dawn. When he awoke, he finally completed his long journey to Charingworth and began making his inquiries into the whereabouts of his master. He first called upon a tenant named Edward Plaisterer, who confirmed with John that he had indeed seen William the day before and that he had paid his rent, but that William had not stayed any longer to socialise. Next, John visited a second tenant named William Curtis, who likewise confirmed that William had come round on the previous day, but having not been at home at the time, he had not seen him personally. As far as Curtis was aware, he had left Charingworth by the early evening to return to Chipping Camden. At somewhat of a loss, John began walking back to Camden, and as he reached the outskirts of the town at around 5am, he stumbled straight into William's son, Edward Harrison, who had too been sent out by his mother in search of both his father and his now also missing servant. John relayed the information that he had gleaned from Charingworth, and the two men paired up and walked over to the nearby village of Ebrington, midway between Camden and Charingworth. Hearing nothing in Ebrington, they next walked a further mile south to the village of Paxford, but once again heard nothing of the presence of William. Resigned to the mission ending in failure, the two men started upon their return to Camden. The main highway was once again beginning to bustle with the early morning traders, and as they walked, they began to hear the stories of a woman who had picked up a bloody collar and other items on the highway further ahead outside of Camden. Catching up to the rumours and finding the woman leasing in some fields outside of the town, they confirmed their worst suspicions. The woman who had been out on the road early had stumbled across a hat, a collar and a comb by the roadside and had picked them up only to find that the hat and comb were badly cut and torn whilst the collar was covered in a clear bloodstain. Edward took the items from her and quickly confirmed that all three had belonged to his father and demanded that the woman took them to the spot where she had found them. Upon their arrival, however, neither himself nor John could find any more trace of William, nor of any attack that may have taken place. Hurrying back to Camden, the pair alerted as many people in the town as they could, and with the news quickly spreading, a large-scale search was soon underway, with men, women and children all taking part looking for any trace of William Harrison. Despite the large scale of the search, however, it too was wholly unsuccessful and no clue was discovered by a single soul. It appeared to all in the town as if William Harrison had been entirely spirited away. The searchers continued for the entire day and turned up no trace of William Harrison. With absolutely no evidence to follow up on and no clue of where to look next, Mrs. Harrison instead decided to report her servant, John Perry, to the local justice of the peace on suspicion that she had sent him out on the evening of her husband's disappearance to meet him and he had not returned until the following day. It was a tenuous link and a suspicion with little basis in any real evidence. But still, the justice of the peace picked up John Perry and questioned him over the matter. Perry told his side of the story detailing the men that he had met both from Camden and Charingworth, who were promptly checked out and all confirmed Perry's story. Upon no other reason other than there was no other suspect, John Perry was then jailed until the end of the week, the 24th of August, to allow for further inquiry into the strange disappearance. During his incarceration, which alternated between the local prison and the local inn, several rumours began to surface and float around the town of Camden. Stories that William Harrison had been murdered by a gang of tinkers surfaced, whilst others pushed the suspicion further onto Perry by circulating stories that he had told them himself that he had murdered his master. On the 24th, when he made his return to be interrogated by the Justice of the Peace, Perry's story had made a swift and dramatic about-face turn. He now told the Justice of the Peace 
that he did in fact know the fate of his master, that he knew that he had been murdered, but he insisted, not by him. Interested by these new revelations, the Justice of the Peace demanded he elucidate upon the matter, at which point Perry confessed that the murders had in fact been carried out by none other than his mother, Joan, and his brother, Richard. Recognising instantly what a strange confession this was, the Justice of the Peace asked Perry to confirm that he knew precisely what it was that he was saying with his confession. John Perry confidently confirmed that he knew it well and pressed on with a new story of the night of the disappearance of William Harrison. In the beginning, his story followed much of the same path as his earlier, with his mistress asking him to walk to Charingworth with the hope that he would meet up with William along the highway. After he left the house, however, it immediately began to differ. Here he now said that he met with his brother Richard in the street and the pair had walked to the church, with John explaining to Richard his plan to meet his master along the road. When they reached the church, John chose to walk through the churchyard whilst Richard walked around it, the pair meeting up again on the other side. With neither having seen William, they continued on towards Charingworth. As they passed a few hundred yards down the road together, they reached an area of the land known as the Conagree. The Conagree was a private, gated garden owned by Lady Camden. Knowing that William had a key for the gate, and having just seen a shadowy figure pass through, John suggested to Richard that it was more than likely William himself. Whilst Richard entered into the garden intending to rob William, John took a turn around the local field before himself entering into the garden following both the shadowy figure and his brother Richard. When he stepped through the unlocked gate, he found his brother and mother standing over the lifeless body of his master lying on the ground. John told the Justice of the Peace that he pleaded with his brother not to kill him, but his brother yelled back at him, calling him a fool, and pounced on the body, strangling him and taking out the rent money that he had spent the evening collecting from his pockets. John and Richard then spent the rest of the evening disposing of the body, apparently carrying it up to the garden of the neighbouring house to toss it into its cesspit. His mother gave him the hat, comb and collar, and told him to dispose of it along the highway to make it look like a robbery that had taken place elsewhere. John Perry's story then tied back in with his earlier timeline, where he told of how he had met up with the local Camden men and taken a rest in the hen house. It was a remarkable confession, and the Justice of the Peace set about attempting to confirm the facts of it all. A search party was sent to the local cesspit to have it dredged for the body of William, and Joan and Richard Perry were quickly sent for to be arrested. Things quickly began to seem off colour, however, when no body was found in the cesspit, nor any pit, nor, in fact, any body of water in the local vicinity, and when Joan and Richard arrived before the Justice of the Peace and categorically denied their involvement with any robbery or murder, things didn't seem to be adding up. The next day, whilst the Perry family were being transported between the jail and the Justice for the Peace to undergo further interrogations, Richard dropped a small length of linen tape on the ground. The guards pounced on the object and demanded to know what it was, and whilst Richard assured them that it was nothing but his wife's hair lace, John told them later that it was the murder weapon and the very piece of thread that Richard had used to strangle William. Whilst they stood in front of the Justice of the Peace together, John doubled down, once more insisting that he had assisted in the murder of William, which had been carried out by his brother and mother. He went further too, explaining that his family had in fact always had eyes on robbing William Harrison since that he had begun working under him as a servant, and that they had always made plans to utilise John's knowledge of his master's comings and goings to do so. They had, he told his interrogators, already in fact robbed him once before, and further confessed that a robbery that had taken place a year prior of £140 which had been stolen from the Harrison house whilst they had been at church was once again his mother and brother, who had used information on the location of the money given to them by himself. He insisted that the family had planned it together and had buried the money with designs to split it later. Once again, the story was investigated and the money searched for, but nothing was found to corroborate John's story and no money was ever found. It was a fairly bizarre set of circumstances, and the trio were jailed until the September Assizes, 
at which point they are all put on trial for both the robbery and murder of William Harrison. Since no body had ever been recovered, the judge threw out the confession of the murderer immediately, but tried all three instead on the charge of robbery. All three initially pleaded not guilty, but after being assured that their case would fall under the Act of Oblivion, an act that had been brought in that year to award amnesty to a great many crimes perpetrated under the Commonwealth and prior to the restoration of King Charles II, they changed their plea and were promptly found guilty by the jury. The trial saw little new revelations, with John Perry continuing with his story that his family had killed William, but he also now added that during the time that they had been incarcerated awaiting trial, both his mother and brother had attempted to poison his food, and he no longer trusted them enough to eat together with them. The trio were then jailed and tried a second time at the following spring assizes. This time, the judge was less keen to toss out the murder charge despite there still not being any sign of a body, nor, in fact, any shred of evidence to support the charge other than John Perry's confession. The only evidence, in fact, was the witness testimony of several men who all testified that they had seen the previous trial where they had heard John Perry confess to the murder. For his part, John had now changed his tune once more. He now insisted that he had been mad at the time of his previous confession, and he pleaded not guilty along with his mother and brother, but it was much, much too late, and all three were found guilty of both the robbery and murder of William Harrison and sentenced to hang. The execution of the Perry family was swift, taking place on Broadway Hill on the outskirts of Camden Town. Joan was hung first on account that during her time in prison, local rumours had spread the suggestion that she was a witch who had perhaps bewitched her sons to do her bidding. The theory followed that if she was hanged first, perhaps her spell could be broken and the two sons, though too late to save themselves, could at least confess to their crimes and beg forgiveness. The hanging of their mother, however, appeared to have little effect, and both men insisted up until their death that they were innocent. Though John Perry did curiously state that he knew nothing of the death, he was sure that the town would hear of the truth eventually. Joan and Richard were buried on Broadway Hill beneath the gallows, though several days after their execution, both were exhumed as locals insisted on digging up the body of Joan to ensure the witchcraft had been put to bed. Following the trial, rumours spoke of how William Harrison's wife committed suicide by hanging herself while suffering a deep melancholy. Though the truth of this is open to debate, as no records of her death to be found in the local records. It was the end of a bizarre series of events that had whipped up quite a frenzy amongst the locals of Camden. What appeared to be the end, however, was revealed to simply be the opening act, as two years later, William Harrison walked back into town very much alive. In 1662, two years on from the trial and hanging of Joan, Richard and John Perry for the murder of William Harrison, the old man, now 72 years of age, strolled carefree back into the village of Camden, oblivious to all that had gone on during his absence. Clearly it was a shock for all who were involved in the original case, not least of all to Sir Robert Hyde, the judge who sentenced the Perrys to death, whom, upon being told of Harrison's return, ordered the servant who brought him the information to be locked up in jail for spreading falsehoods. It was a sensational story, however, and much to Sir Hyde's chagrin, a full account of both the story of the Perry family's trial and a full, first-hand account from William Harrison was published in a pamphlet titled The Camden Wonder, written by Thomas Overbury in 1676. As a fitting twist to what was now a truly bizarre tale, Harrison's account for his absence was not one of simple memory loss nor humdrum vanishing, but a story of kidnapping, high seas, slavery and escape. Better told in his own words, what follows is the letter written by William Harrison himself and sent to Thomas Overbury for publication 15 years after his return in 1676. Honoured sir, in obedience to your commands, I give you this true account of my being carried away beyond the seas, my continuance there, and return home. On a Thursday in the afternoon in the time of harvest, 
I went to Charingworth to demand rents due to my Lady Camden, at which time the tenants were busy in the fields, and late before they came home, which occasioned my stay there till the close of the evening. I expected a considerable sum, but received only three and twenty pounds, and no more. In my return home, in the narrow passage amongst Ebrington Furzes, there met me one horseman, and said, Art thou there? And I, fearing that he would have rid over me, struck his horse over the nose, whereupon he struck at me with his sword several blows, and run it into my side, while I, with my little cane, made my defence as well as I could. At last, another came behind me, run me into the thigh, laid hold of the collar of my doublet, and drew me to a hedge near to the place. Then came in another. They did not take my money, but mounted me behind one of them, drew my arms about his middle, and fastened my wrists together with something that had a spring lock, as I conceived, by hearing it give a snap as they put it on. Then they threw a great cloak over me and carried me away. In the night they alighted at a hayrick, which stood near to a stone pit by a wall side, where they took away my money. About two hours before day, as I heard one of them tell the other he thought it to be then, they tumbled me into the stone pit. They stayed, as I thought, about an hour at the hayrick. When they took horse again, one of them bade me come out of the pit. I answered, they had my money already, and asked what they would do with me. Whereupon he struck me again, drew me out, and put a great quantity of money into my pockets, and mounted me again after the same manner. And on the Friday, about sun setting, they brought me to a lone house upon a heath, by a thicket of bushes, where they took me down almost dead, being sorely bruised with the carriage of the money. When the woman of the house saw that I could neither stand nor speak, she asked them whether or no they had bought a dead man. They answered no, but a friend that was hurt, and that they were carrying him to a surgeon. She answered, if they did not make haste, their friend would be dead before they could bring him to one. There they laid me on cushions, and suffered none to come into the room but a little girl. There we stayed all night. They gave me some broth and strong waters. In the morning, very early, they mounted me as before, and on Saturday night they brought me to a place where were two or three houses, in one of which I lay all night on cushions by their bedside. On Sunday morning they carried me from thence, and about three or four o'clock they brought me to a place by the seaside called Deal, where they laid me down on the ground, and, one of them staying by me, the other two walked a little way off to meet a man with whom they talked, and in their discourse I heard them mention seven pounds, after which they went away together, and about half an hour after returned. The man, whose name as after I heard, was Renshaw, said he feared I would die before he could get me on board. Then presently, they put me into a boat and carried me on shipboard, where my wounds were dressed. I remained in the ship as near as I could reckon, about six weeks, in which time I was indifferently recovered from my wounds and weaknesses. Then the master of the ship came and told me, and the rest who were in the same condition, that he discovered three Turkish ships. We all offered a fight in the defence of the ship and ourselves, but he commanded us to keep close and said he would deal with them well enough. A little while after, he called us up, and when we came onto the deck, we saw two Turkish ships close by us. Into one of them we were put and placed in a dark hole, where how long we continued before we landed, I know not. When we were landed, they led us two days' journey and put us into a great house or prison where we remained four days and a half and then came to us eight men to view us who seemed to be officers. They called us and examined us of our trades and callings which everyone answered. One said he was a surgeon, another that he was a broadcloth weaver, and I, after two or three demands, said I had some skill in physic. We three were set by and taken by three of those eight men that came to view us. It was my chance to be chosen by a grave physician of 87 years of age who lived near Smyrna, who had formerly been in England, and knew Crowland in Lincolnshire, which he preferred before all other places in England. He employed me to keep his still house and gave me a silver bowl, double gilt to drink in. My business was most in that place, but once he set me to gather cotton wool, which I not doing to his mind, he struck me down to the ground and after drew his stiletto to stab me, but, holding up my hands to him, he gave a stamp and turned from me, 
for which I render thanks to my Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who stayed his hand and preserved me. I was there about a year and three quarters, and then my master fell sick on a Thursday and sent for me, and calling for me as he used, by the name of Bol, told me that he should die, and bade me shift for myself. He died on Saturday following, and I presently hastened with my bowl to a port almost a day's journey distance, the way to which place I knew, having been twice there employed by my master about the carriage of his cotton wool. When I came thither, I addressed myself to two men who came out of a ship of Hambra, which, as they said, was bound for Portugal within three or four days. I inquired of them for an English ship. They answered that there was none. I entreated them to take me into their ship, and they answered they durst not, for fear of being discovered by the searchers, which might occasion their forfeiture not only of their goods, but also of their lives. I was very importunate with them, but could not prevail. They left me to wait on Providence, which, at length, brought another out of the same ship, to whom I made known my condition, craving his assistance for my transportation. He made me the like answer as the former, and was as stiff in his denial, till the sight of my bowl put him to a pause. He returned to the ship, he came back again accompanied with another seaman, and from my bowl undertook to transport me, but told me I must be contented to lie down in the keel and endure many hardships, which I was content to do to gain my liberty. So they took me aboard and placed me below in the vessel in a very uneasy place, and obscured me with boards and other things, where I lay undiscovered, notwithstanding the strict search that was made in the vessel. My two chapmen, who had my bowl, honestly furnished me with victuals daily, until we arrived at Lisbon in Portugal, where, as soon as the master had left the ship and was gone into the city, they left me on shore, moneyless, to shift for myself. I knew not what course to take, but as Providence led me, I went up into the city and came into a fair street, and being weary, I turned my back to a wall and leaned up against my staff. Over against me were four gentlemen discoursing together. After a while, one of them came to me and spoke to me in a language that I understood not. I told him I was an Englishman and understood not what he spoke. He answered me in plain English that he understood me and was himself born near Weesbitch in Lincolnshire. Then I related to him my sad condition and he, taking compassion on me, took me with him provided for me lodging and diet, and by his interest with the master of a ship bound for England, procured my passage and bring me on shipboard, he bestowed wine and strong waters on me, and, at his return, gave me eight stivers and recommended me to the care of the master of the ship, who landed me safe at Dover. From whence I made shift to get to London, where, being furnished with necessaries, I came into the country. Thus, honoured sir, I have given you a true account of my great sufferings and happy deliverance by the mercy and goodness of God, my most gracious Father in Jesus Christ, my Saviour and Redeemer, to whose name be ascribed all honour, praise and glory. I conclude and rest. Your worships, in all dutiful respect, William Harrison. William Harrison's account of his absence is a truly strange tale. It piles question upon question on top of the story so far, whilst answering almost none. Furthermore, as fascinating as it is, it is almost undoubtedly a work of pure fiction. Whilst it may sound ridiculous, it's important to confirm whether or not much of the story of the Camden Wandering is actually true at all. It would not have been at all unusual for stories, much like this one, to have been fabricated by overzealous religious folk looking to push a narrative, nor by budding fiction writers who may have sought to turn a profit using a more pseudo-journalistic approach to publishing and profiting off the back of a sensationalist story. Fortunately, the records show us that, in the very least, the Perry family certainly did exist. Their trials took place, as did their executions. It can also be confirmed that all of the principal characters did exist. The judges were real people, and they did indeed hold their positions, and probably, most importantly, William Harrison certainly existed. His two-year disappearance can also be confirmed by his absence from the meetings held by the local grammar school's board of governors, of which he was a member and of which he attended religiously in the years leading to 1660 and the years following 1662 until years later after his presumed death. Any account of the Camden Wonder 
has been derived from at least one of only three contemporary sources, the first two of which were published shortly after the re-emergence of William Harrison and appear to be written with a religious bent, warning of the dangers of witchcraft and the glory of God. The third source was published 15 years on from the event, probably after many of the main characters were deceased in order to avoid legal ramifications, and appears to be derived from a first-hand account of the justice of the peace. For the most part, this later source attempts to strip much of the spiritual and superstitious angle from the first two sources and presents the story in a much more straightforward manner. Of the earliest two sources, one is a ballad that was discovered by Mr. E. O. Winstead on the shelves of the Bodleian Library in 1945. Amongst those wonders which on earth are shown, in any age there seldom hath been known, a thing more strange than that which this relation doth here present unto your observation. In Gloucestershire, as many know full well, at Camden Town a gentleman did dwell, one Mr. William Harrison by name, a steward to a lady of great fame. A widow likewise in the town there was, a wicked wretch who brought strange things to pass, so wonderful that some will scarce receive these lines for truth, nor yet my words believe. But such as unto Camden do resort, they surely found this no false report, though many lies are daily now invented, this is a true song as ere was printed. Thereunto the story now give ear, this widow Perry as it doth appear, and her two sons all fully were agreed against their friend to work a wicked deed. One of her sons, even from a youth did dwell, was Mr. Harrison, who loved him well, and bred him up, his mother being poor, but see how he requited him therefore, for taking notice that his master went abroad to gather his lady's rent, and by that means it was an usual thing for him great store of money home bring. He thereupon, with his mischievous mother, and likewise with his vile ungodly brother, contrived to rob his master for these base, and cruel wretched were past shame and grace. One night they met him coming into town, and in a barbarous manner knocked him down, then taking all his money quite away, his body out of sight they did convey. But being all suspected for this deed, they apprehended were, and sent with speed, to Gloucester jail, and there upon their trial, were guilty found for all their stiff denial. It was supposed the gentleman was dead, and by these wretches rode and furthered. Therefore they were all three condemned to death, and I on Broadway Hill, they lost their breath. One of the sons was buried with his mother under the gibbet, but the other brother, that served the gentleman, was hanged in chains, and there some part of him yet remains. But yet before they died they did proclaim, even in the ears of this that thither came, that Mr. Harrison yet living was, and would be found in less than seven years' space. Which words of theirs for truth do now appear, for tis but two years since they hanged were, and now the gentleman alive is found, which news is published through the countries round. But less than any of this truth shall doubt, I'll let you how the business came about. This widow Perry, as tis plainly shown, was then a witch, although it was not known. So when these villains, by their mother's aid, had knocked him down, even as before was said, they took away his money every whit, and then his body cast into a pit. His scarce was come into himself before, another wonder did amaze him more, that whilst he looked about, he found that he was suddenly conveyed unto the sea. First on the shore he stood a little space, and thence unto a rock transported was, where he four days and nights did then remain, and never thought to see his friends again. But as the Turkish ship was passing by, some of the men the gentleman did spy, and took him, and as I understand, they carried him into the Turkish land. And there, not knowing of his sad disaster, they quickly did provide for him a master, a surgeon or of some such like profession, whose service he performed with much discretion. It seems in gathering herbs he had good skill, and could the same exceeding well distill, which to his master great content did give, and pleased him well so long as he did live. But as soon as he died, and at his death he gave him, a piece of plate so that no one should enslave him, but that to his liberty he might obtain to come into his native land again. And thus this gentleman his freedom bought, and by a turkey ship from thence was brought to Portugal, and now both safe and sound, he is at length arrived on English ground. Let not this seem incredible to any, because it is an end affirmed by many, 
This is no faint story, though tis new, but as tis very strange, tis very true. You see how far a witch's power extends, when as to wickedness her mind she bends. Great is her malice, yet can God restrain her, and at his pleasure let her loose or chain her. If God had let her work her utmost sight, no doubt she would have killed the man outright. But he is saved, and she for all her malice was very justly hanged upon the gallows. Then let all praise to God alone be given, by men on earth as by the saints in heaven. He by his mercy daily doth befriend us, and by his power he will still defend us. The second source continues much in the same vein, pronouncing the entire affair to be a product of witchcraft perpetrated by Mrs. Joan Perry, using her wicked magic to whisk William Harrison away to Turkey, where he was eventually saved by the long reach of God who, apparently, worked in mysterious ways. The third source is where the bulk of the information for the story so far comes from, including the first-hand account from William Harrison himself, and whilst the account of Perry's arrest and subsequent trial is undoubtedly the most concrete form of documentation on the subject, the first-hand account by Harrison is almost perfectly written off across the board for having any shred of truth by any historians who have dealt with the case over the years. When first dealing with the matter of John Perry's confession, Andrew Lang, historian and writer of the Camden Mystery, published in 1904, called him conspicuously crazy, suggesting that he had made up his entire confession of both the robberies and the murders, and later, his delusions continued when he grew paranoid, claiming that his mother and brother were trying to poison him. He pointed out that his confession was entirely incompatible with his earlier alibi, and those accounts given by the witnesses who all confirmed that they had met John along the road on the night of William's disappearance. In all likelihood, the Perry's only point of guilt was that of being a family whose reputation in the local town was probably not very robust. Members of the servant class, and with Joan's husband dying, suspicion and prejudice would have been quick to write her off as a hag, or, in extreme cases as we see, a witch, something that was often true of elderly, poor widows. Once a trial had begun, John's confession could potentially have stood for nothing if only they had stuck with their not guilty plea and in all likelihood their taking of advice to plead guilty in order to be granted amnesty was their biggest mistake which came back to bite them in their second trial where they were eventually sentenced to hang. As we are to find out, it is undeniable that John's confession was untrue given the fact that William Harrison was alive and so we are left to ask the largest question. Why had he confessed at all? The theories here can only lead to speculation, and several have been floated, that of stress from incarceration leading to mental breakdowns, false confessions, and even a theory involving an Oedipal complex. But in the end, we are only left to guess. One of the hardest parts to square away with John Perry's confession is that not only was he condemning his own mother and brother to death by telling his story, but he was sacrificing himself in the process. So then, what of the dramatic appearance of William Harrison? Was there any truth to his story whatsoever? In the first instance, it's almost inconceivable that after kidnapping Harrison, a trio of kidnappers could then toss him on the back of a horse with a cloak pulled over his head and to ride halfway across the country from Camden in the west to Deal, a coastal town in Kent, almost 200 miles to the southeast, and not draw any suspicion along the way. Furthermore, stabbing a kidnapped victim and nearly killing him would be a bizarre way to treat the victim if the eventual plan was to sell him as a slave, and this is before we even question the fact that nobody in their right mind would consider a 70-year-old man a fitting prospect for the slave trade at all. Had a crew of kidnappers been taken captive for purposes of private fiscal policy, they would have shipped them to the Virginian plantations, where Turkish galleys did not venture, and they would not have captured men of 70. Moreover, kidnappers would not damage their captives by stabbing them in the side and thigh, when no resistance was made, as was done to Harrison. So if there really is little to no truth on the account of William Harrison, which Andrew Lang, who we just heard from, goes on to call a delirious tissue of nonsense, why did he feel the need to make up such a story? Where had he been for the previous two years? And just who knew? 
Did his wife know? And was that, perhaps, why she later hung herself due to the guilt of watching the Perry family hang for a crime that she knew they didn't commit? This, of course, is if the story of the suicide was in fact true at all. Did, perhaps, John Perry know all along? And was William's reappearance, the meaning of his final words, when he told the crowd watching his execution that they would know the truth of William Harrison in time? Had he, in fact, worked with his master to help him alight on the night of his disappearance, when he wasted all the time sleeping in hen coops and under roadside hedges in order to buy his master some time to escape? What if the only shred of tooth to any of this confession at all was that he did indeed dump the comb, hat and collar by the roadside in order to plant a red herring, the details of why and on whose orders being the only things that he changed. Without knowing much of William Harrison's political and personal background, however, they all seem to be questions which we are unlikely to discover the answers to. In the end, the Camden Wonder is a tantalising but ultimately frustrating mystery and one that has endured for over 350 years. We may speculate, but the truth will, perhaps, forever be buried in history, if not due to the lack of surviving records, purely due to the bizarre circumstances that took place in one of the strangest mysteries in English history. Just as Andrew Lang concluded in 1904, At the back of the Camden mystery, there is not a glimmer of reason, nor of sane human nature. The occurrences are, to all appearances, as motiveless as the events in a feverish dream. So that was the story of the Camden Wonder, and it is completely bonkers. And, I mean, there, there is so, so much to question and talk about in this. So we'll dig into a little bit of that after these short advert breaks. Thanks for listening to Dark Histories. This podcast is entirely independent and funded by myself and listener support. So in order to do that, I need to run a few ads. Our long-time advertising partner is Audible, and the reason I've stuck with them for so long is that they offer a service that I actually use and enjoy myself. And I do think it actually offers value to people like myself who enjoy podcasts. If you're unaware of what Audible is, it's an audiobook subscription service which charges a monthly fee in return for one credit, which you're free to spend on any audiobook you like. The catalogue is huge, multilingual and covers everything from fiction to series of lectures. They have an iOS, Android and web app and if you use more than one, they all sync up together so that you can listen on any of your devices without having to skip about. If you ever feel like you want to take a break from the subscription, you can do so and you get to keep all your previously bought books and when you get into a drought, you can just fire it up again and start gaining credits seamlessly. Some of my favourite books on there to date are the complete Sherlock Holmes, which is read by Stephen Fry. And they've also got the original Exorcist book and just a huge history back catalogue. And I've really enjoyed all of those, basically. So if this sounds like something you might be interested in, head over to audible.com forward slash dark histories. And that's dark histories all one word. And you can start a free trial that offers a monthly subscription with one free credit so that you can instantly pick an audiobook of your choice. If at the end of the trial you feel like it's not really for you, you can just cancel it and it's cost you nothing and you get to keep your free book. So once again, that's audible.com forward slash dark histories or you can find the link in the show notes. So earlier I mentioned listener support and there are a ton of ways that you can get involved and support Dark Histories. The main way is to become a Patreon patron. If you listen to a lot of podcasts, I'm sure you're familiar by now, but for those not so much, Patreon is a way to make a monthly pledge in return for some small perks. On the Dark Histories Patreon, I set my pledges as low as I can really with options for one, three and five dollars per month. And for that, you gain things like early access episodes without these horrible ads, PDF notes and resources that I make and find during my research for each episode. There's also access to the live stream archives and more. So if you enjoy the show and you think it's worth it to you, 
hop over to darkhistories.com and you can find all the ways that you can support, including our Patreon, or just check out the links in the show notes. If none of that appeals, then sharing it around with all your friends and family is equally as helpful and just as much appreciated. So if you're here, then thanks so much for not skipping the ads with that 30 second skip button and giving my hard sell a listen. I'll let you get back to the episode. Cheers. So the Camden Wonder is an absolutely bonkers story and it seems to be one that's completely forgotten and sort of lost to time. It's one of the coolest things, I think, about the modern sources for this case. And I say modern in in sort of like quote unquote there because most of them were written like well over 100 years ago and the real kind of like authoritative source and the real kind of main book on this um, that's sort of even nowadays considered to be like the kind of the best book on the on the Camden Wonder it was published in 1959. Um, so it seems that the whole story and mystery is it's just been completely lost to history, and, and it's it's interesting how it's sort of it, it's obviously sort of just fallen out of fashion and kind of been swallowed up. But it's excellent. It's a absolutely bonkers story, say, um, and really excellent. So I, I was really glad to be able to retell it and get the story back out there because I think it's, yeah, just a truly excellent mystery that could really do with new investigation and which I tried to do a little bit of, but st- it's still very much mired under, well, the difficulties of any mystery of its age, really, um, where you're kind of digging up sort of multiple spellings of surnames and multiple instances of the same names in the same area. But So, for example, like there, there's a whole bunch of William Harrisons that lived in this area at that time, and it's difficult to decipher from just records, like, which was which. So it, it's instantly really difficult to start digging into this stuff. But as for the, the kind of more modern sources, I, I absolutely recommend, if you enjoyed this story, I absolutely recommend trying to get hold of Andrew Lang's chapter on it called The Camden Wonder, it was published in 1904 and it's in his book, which is called Historical Mysteries. And, it, and it's hilarious. His writing style is brilliant and, and absolutely worth a read. It's it's full of like serious humour uh, that, that even still kind of stands up today. Like it, the, the incredulous sarcasm that he uses is, is absolutely on point. Yeah, he really tears apart William Harrison's account of his disappearance it absolutely lays into him fully and it's it's very funny to read. Being from 1904, obviously a lot of the times you read sources so old and you, you're kind of deciphering like this old archaic language. Even from 1904, you know, you are deciphering to a certain degree. It's obviously better than something that's written 300 years ago, but it's still generally, you know, older language. But he writes with such a great sort of modern zippy style that it's really easy to read and I so I definitely recommend it he tears say William Harrison apart and it's hilarious so yeah definitely if you find this story um interesting have a look at the sources so which are in the show notes um and check out the Camden Wonder by Andrew Lang because it's it's excellent um but yeah to the actual story I mean wow okay it really has to be divided into two parts, doesn't it? So first of all, you've got the Perrys. What the hell was going on there? What was John Perry's confession all about? Obviously, it was a false confession. But, but what on earth had led him to do that? The main theories, it seems, are that he was potentially under a lot of stress um, from the arrest and that he basically had kind of heard these rumours that had been going around of it being a tinker or also that, that it could have been him. And he basically sort of took them on board as delusions and, and ran with them. So this is like one of the main theories. I, I'm not really sure if, if he would have been that stressed from from what was going on. So, so, so basically it digs into the idea that he'd been essentially palmed off to the Harrisons as a servant at a young age because... His family were poor um, and so they couldn't really afford to raise him. So they'd given him as a servant to the Harrisons who had raised him as their own kind of thing and and as a servant as well. And his father had died um, three years prior to what happened 
And so a lot of the theories go on this idea that this had kind of caused uh, a lot of kind of mental instability in John Perry and that it had kind of been a downhill snowball from that point onwards and that actually the arrest was almost like a final nail in the coffin of his sort of mental instability and it just sort of tipped him over the edge and he, he's kind of suffering from like a mental breakdown and then he'd heard these rumours and then he kind of just sort of took them on board as himself and decided to start just confessing. Bonkers. I don't know how much credit I give that kind of theory. I mean, I don't really know. It's, the thing is, it's all conjecture at this point, but it's an interesting theory nonetheless. Some of the other theories, they get a little bit out there. There's a, a big theory written in uh, George Clark's book, which goes in about the Oedipus complex and all this. And it all gets very bogged down in dated, antiquated psychology, really. Um, nowadays, I feel like we know a lot more about false confessions and why people do it. But the the, the problem is, is, is that there, there's so vast reasons quite often, and they're often due to sort of quite personal or quite localised reasons, um, and, and none of the details we're really given um, to sort of make those judgments, I don't think, on, on John Perry. He obviously had something there. It's clear that he had delusions. It, it did seem that, like, he, he, he sort of was making up a lot of stuff there. So with the, the previous robbery as well that he blamed on his family. And he also said that he um, had stopped uh, uh, another robbery or attack by two other men at some point and then say he was went on to say that he was being poisoned and stuff, which sort of led to like, it made me think like perhaps paranoid delusions there. But to be honest, possibly paranoid delusions. I mean, he had just grasped up his family. Maybe they really were trying to poison him. But... I, I don't know, it, it seemed that he was clearly a bit bro broken. Um, the fact that he then later went on to say, during the second trial, he was seemingly saying that he was mad during the first trial and when he'd given his original confession and that now that he was pleading not guilty. So I, I, it's really hard to work out what was going on, but clearly there was something really wrong there. I think that's the best thing we can really come up with and just sort of leave it at that, really. And, and it, I find it bizarre that he dropped his family in it, but there could have been reasons for that. But it's also the fact that he was essentially sacrificing himself in doing so. I mean, wow, that's that's a that's pretty bold, right? So, I mean, then at that point, you're just thinking, you're mad. Like, clearly, you've got... You're unhinged somewhere. Um, but quite a fascinating introduction to the story say because then we're then bought harrison's account which is brilliant i mean william harrison's account is clearly total bull right like i mean it's great account i i say i included the whole thing because i i thought it would do it much more justice but i mean it's clearly bull i i, I when i first was reading it i instantly was thinking this is surely a fiction the whole kind of spirit being sort of kidnapped and and being sold to turkish traders and all the rest of it it was just such a kind of overblown story i mean in many respects you can say you know it's the stories like that that are often true because you you sort of say oh yeah but it's too overblown it's too over the top well it doesn't matter it must have happened to somebody you know it could happen to somebody but i think in this case it really was a case of a man who had never actually left England and was just kind of making up this big kind of blockbuster kind of story of him disappearing. But sadly, we're just not going to know why why it happened. We're not going to know why he disappeared and came back in two years. I think the only way we could ever know is if we knew his political sort of leanings and his sort of even his personal sort of dealings around the time. And... You know, then you can sign, kind of put the disappearance into a context and maybe find a motive. But I think without that, we're just not going to know why he disappeared. So I so say you could speculate on that almost forever. There, there were reasons he could have disappeared. Say, like, with it being so soon after the restoration and all that, um, and with his being a steward for uh, quite 
rich, well-off family, there, there are, I'm sure there are reasons that he could have needed to have disappeared for t- two years there. But what they were, we just we just never know. I say it could all just be really just fall into speculation. I think again, something else that just falls to speculation, but is is more interesting in the questions that we're left to ask is who knew that he was going to disappear? Did his wife know? And is that why she killed herself, if she killed herself at all? I, I think that's very possible that perhaps she did, and, and perhaps that is. But I mean, there's, again, because she's got other reasons to kill herself. Maybe, you know, after the trial and everything, it all just hit home that her husband wasn't coming back and she killed herself for that reason. You never know. So again, it, we're, it's all just speculation, isn't it? But th- there's every chance that she did know. And, you know, did John Perry know? You know, he was a faithful servant, treated very much like a son. Did he know that, you know, his master and essentially true father figure in his life was going to be disappearing? And I think it's an interesting twist to the tale that perhaps he did dump the stuff by the roadside, like the collar and the, the hat and whatnot and the comb. Perhaps that's the only part of his confession that was true and that perhaps parts of his confession were based in reality, but not because of the reasons that he gave them. You know, perhaps he did dump them there and he was given them by William to sort of cause a red herring. I I, I think that's an interesting theory that he was buying, you know, that's why he spent all that time wasting time basically as well to sort of buy his master an extra evening to get away, maybe. It's it's very interesting. Say it's a fascinating story with a million questions and absolutely no answers, sadly. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I think it's a cracking mystery. I think it's it's been a bit of a long time since we've really sort of got into a proper mystery like this. So I'm really glad to have covered it. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Say so you wanna read any of the sources, I, I definitely recommend Andrew Lang's one. And all of those are in the show notes, or you can find them on the website, which is darkhistories.com. You'll also be able to find places there that you can review and some ways that you can support the podcast and the ways that you can sort of join in with the community over on Discord. Basically, all the social medias, everything, all of that stuff is on darkhistories.com. So it's pretty much a one-stop shop. If you want to go and find anything out, check that out. Um, Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much for all your kind support, for always listening and for all your kind emails and messages always. I'll be back in a couple of weeks. So until then, take care. Thanks very much for listening. Sleep tight.